technically at the awards the other day, I said, wise ass Latina. I'm not sure that makes a difference, but that is what I said. Thank you um, for letting me come and address you today. You know, when you come into the world with the name Maria de la Soledad Teresa Marchetti O'Brien, um, you're going to be dealing with identity issues your whole life. I am a first-generation American. My dad is Australian, uh, and he's white. My mother is Cuban, and she's black. And of course, who you are and where you're from matters a lot when you're one of six children uh, raised in an American suburb where no one can seem to manage to pronounce your name, and you don't look like anybody else. But it's because of my parents. I know who I am, and I know what I am. I'm a mixed race Latina, a first generation American, acutely aware of how nuanced the conversations about identity have to be. My parents met in 1958, uh, not very far from here in Baltimore, Maryland. My mother would tell us a story uh, how she used to walk to daily mass. She was uh, studying at Johns Hopkins University and my dad was working on his PhD. And she would walk to daily mass and my dad would drive because he had a car. And as he drove by, because they sort of recognized each other, he would wind down his window and say, would you like a ride? And my mother would say, no, thank you, because you don't take a ride from a man you don't know well. I was like, gosh, even on the way to daily mass? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's a safe guy. It's the guy going to daily mass. But I digress. Uh, and so day after day, my father would drive by. Do you want a ride? No, thank you. No, thank you, until one day she said yes. And they decided to go on a date that night. And every single place they went, because it was Baltimore in 1958, and my dad is white and my mother's black, they wouldn't seat them together. Every place said to my father, you can come in, but you can't come in, and you certainly can't come together. My mother told us a story about how she took my father back to her apartment after they were turned down restaurant after restaurant, and she made him, she's an amazing cook of incredible Cuban food, and she made him dinner. And the entire point of her story was, see, if you could cook girls, you could get a man. I kid you not, <laughs> truly. <laughs> we took from the story much more than that. I like to say, I don't make it, but I make it happen. That's the kind of cook I am. <laughs> My parents decided at the end of 1958 to get married. And uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, in the state of Maryland, interracial marriage was illegal. And so they got in their cars and they drove to Washington, D.C. And they got hitched. And then they drove back to Maryland and lived as a married couple. And their friends would tell them, whatever you do, do not have children, because interracial children will never fit in in this world. I'm number five of six. My mother was a terrible listener every step of the way. But she used to tell us, and they also used to live. When obstacles are put in your path, move around them. Walk around them, climb over them, get around them. My mother used to say to us, people do not define you. It's not up to people to define you. God defines you. And then she'd launch into a long reason why I'm not going to church enough. But people do not define you. And because of that, it matters so much that we are here because we get to be the role models for those who maybe didn't have a mother and father like I did, who pushed us every step of the way to be what we wanted to define. When I was growing up, there was um, Gloria Rojas. Gloria Rojas was a reporter on, I think, the NBC channel. We, all, we were an NBC family, so we watched Gloria Rojas. And she would do the most Anglo delivery of the news. At City Hall today, blah, 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 blah. Then later today, we're expecting to hear from the governor, blah, blah, until she got to her sig out, her clothes. And then she'd say, reporting live, this is Gloria Rojas. And I remember thinking, wow, well, if Gloria Rojas can be on TV, Maria de la Zora Teresa Marquette O'Brien could be on TV too. I was giving a speech to, uh, I was being interviewed in Wisconsin, a young woman who is half white, half Japanese, said to me right before the commercial break, before we did our, our interview, she said, you know, at my station, she must have been 20, at my station, they call me a young Soledad O'Brien. I said, girl, I'm a young Soledad O'Brien. <laughs> but, <laughs> remind me never to hire her at CNN. No. But I think, when I'm feeling charitable, I think what she was saying was people like us, who don't necessarily fit into that box, have arrived. That is our time. 
they don't get to define us. We get to define us. My sister, Estella, was a couple years ahead of me at Harvard College, and she was a physics major. And she would tell me all the time how people would tell her, her, her professors, the administrators, minorities do not succeed in physics, and women do not succeed. You should drop this major. You will not make it. And I was writing an article once for Time Magazine about it, so I called her and said, so you got a lot of subtle pressure. She said, no, no, it wasn't subtle. People would call me and tell me, minorities don't succeed, women don't succeed, you should drop your major. She went on to, um, to get her degree in physics from Harvard and then got her master's in astrophysics and then went on to get her MD and her PhD, and she's an eye surgeon now in Harlem. So I guess minorities do succeed sometimes in physics. But she was told, every step of the way, you cannot do it. You will not do it. And I asked her, well, why, do you think you, why did you think you did it? If everyone around you is saying you can't. And she said, because mom made it clear that others don't get to define us. My mother had come to this country for an opportunity, and there wasn't a human being who was going to stop her. And I remember when I started looking for reporting jobs in 1990, Three, I had an interview in Springfield, Massachusetts. And the news director said to me, we did the whole tour, and usually if they're showing you like the back room, the, the, where they play the, you know, the equipment is, that means that you're in. You're going to get the job. They don't show you the back room if you're not going to get the job. And he sat down and he said, I got to tell you, we only have um, a spot for one black reporter. And you're not dark skinned enough. You won't look black on TV. And I remember thinking, literally, wow, should I be more offended <laughs> that they only have one, forget the Latinos, there was no Latino job at all, but the black job, there was only one, or I wasn't going to get the one job that existed. And Hartford, a couple of days later, I had an interview with the news director, went very well until, as Nydia said, he said to me, Soul Dad, that's such, a, that's such a hard name to pronounce. I said, really? I grew up in an all-white neighborhood in Long Island. No one had trouble there. He said, yeah, would you think about changing your name? I said, well, you know, loosely translated, I'm named after the Virgin Mary, and since I don't want to get struck dead by lightning on the way home today, because I've changed my name, no. But each time, I would call my mother and tell her, I don't know where I fit. I can't fit into this box that has been created for what people are supposed to be like. And she would say, bide your time. People do not get to define you. You define yourself. There will be a place that wants you, and you'll get to do the work you want to do. And she was right. I spent my career in local news and then went to the network, and then lately I've been working on documentaries, and I've had a chance now to do stories on people who are undercovered and people who are covered most often one-dimensionally, uh, demonized at times, painted with a very broad brush whatever you want to call it. And it's really been a, a joy, and it's really been truly a, a privilege to tell stories about people from whom we have so much to learn, who have amazing stories, who have a million stories, for whom four hours is going to be a drop in the bucket for 50 million people who have really interesting stories. And you know what? They're not the 10 stories. Everybody does. They're the other 49 million stories that no one does. What a great opportunity. I need 10 hours, at least. I have four small children, and it's in part because of them that I am so happy that I get to devote my time doing stories about a community, our community. It's allowed me an opportunity as well to explore identity, our identity as a community, my identity personally, and how much that identity matters in a, in a nuanced and meaningful way. Our documentary, Latino in America, and the book that goes along with it has kind of my chance to tell uh, the story of how people of different races and different backgrounds with roots in 21 different countries can all be grouped into this thing called Latino. How does, that, how does that work? What do we have in common? What does it mean to be Latino today? And I got to discover a lot about myself and my mom, too, in the process. My mother, who told me, I will never be interviewed for your book finally sat, yeah, toughest, most hostile interview ever, <laughs> finally sat down and talked to me about her trip from Cuba to the United States. Latino, of course, is not simply an ethnicity or a grouping of people who speak Spanish. It's not the same as being Hispanic, so a word that just hints at, at origins. 
It's not about being Latin or from Latin America. It's an experience. It's what happens once we get here. And as you said, we've arrived. We've arrived. The name Garcia, the Garcias are one of the pieces we'll do in our documentary the first night. And it's the number eight, the top 10 most popular American names. Number eight is Garcia. <laughs> that kind of says it all right there. In 2007, the number of new US-born Latinos outpaced those immigrating to the United States. And this boom of Latinos is an American phenomenon. A quarter of the children in the country are Latino. 25% of the kids in this country are Latinos. And we're living everywhere, not just Cayocho in Miami or in East LA, although we do take a look at those communities, but in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, in St. Louis, in Missouri, in Orlando. To say that Latinos are the future of this country, and you'll hear that a lot, it's not enough. We, we are the present of this country. We're here. In Orlando, Florida, I interviewed a guy named Carlos Robles, who is American-born. He is American-bred. He was taking uh, accent reduction classes because he's struggling to get a job. He can't get a job because no one can understand his English. He was raised in Puerto Rico, trying to make a, a goal of it, a go of it, rather, in Florida. And it's his story that we explore the complexity of our country's relationship with Latinos. He is a US citizen trying to get rid of the accent that he acquired on US soil. <laughs> At the same time, our country uh, has room for a wonderful woman, Marlene uh, Ferro, Latina, living in a Miami suburb. And living in Miami, that means that she's going to throw her daughter a quinceanera that is expensive and she is going to find 30 kids to put in her backyard. All of them are second or third generation Americans who can speak fluent Spanish and have been dancing salsa all their lives. And if you ask them, these young people, so are you Cuban or are you American? They look at you sort of confused and they say, I'm both. What do you, what do you mean by that question? I'm both. In Miami, that's okay. It's less clear if that's okay in places like North Carolina where I interviewed Bill and Betty Garcia. They are trying really hard to teach their kids that there's meaning in the fact that your dad's a New Yorkan and your mother is a Dominican. And what does that mean when the children push back? Like any 15 year old, they don't wanna be dragged to the art show. They don't wanna study their history. And because they're brown skinned kids in North Carolina, they think they're black. And their parents say, let's talk about your identity. Who are you? It's a struggle that lots of families have, that search for identity. They don't speak Spanish. They can't communicate with their cousins when they come to back to New York. Who are they? Where do they fit? The parents struggle, the kids struggle too. I interviewed one of the sons and I said to him, so you know, your mother, is offended that you don't embrace her culture. She tries to cook for you, she tries to dance with you, and he's, you, know, you push her back. He said, you misunderstand. I'm embarrassed that I can't. It's not me being embarrassed of her. I'm embarrassed of me. Changed everything, changed everything. Then of course, there's a story we know, the story of Luis Ramirez, who was living in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania when he was reduced to that stereotype illegal immigrant crossing the border, stealing someone's job. And he was beaten to death by a group of teenagers who were convicted in the end of simple assault. Not murder, not homicide, they were convicted of simple assault. And his story is clearly the story of how vulnerable so many people are. Just generations, I mean, you know, you saw Eva Longoria, she's a ninth generation American. She's a ninth, her people were here before the Mayflower. They beat him out. <laughs> and yet, at the same moment she's existing, Luis Ramirez is existing too. She, of course, is the you know, star of Desperate Housewives. But when I asked her what it meant to be a Latina, she literally was perplexed in that same way. And she said, you know, I'm an American. I'm an American with a Mexican heart. She celebrates her heritage and does not allow herself to be reduced to a stereotype about her heritage. And that's really, I think, what we all want, anybody wants. It's a very complex and challenging thing, this Latino identity. 
It's as much about how we see ourselves as how others see us. It's as much about opportunities we embrace as opportunities we push away. Complexity, of course, most apparent in places where there are high concentrations of Latinos. I've been to Miami so many times now. I gained 10 pounds in Miami this year. <laughs> the food at the airport's good in Miami. I mean, that's ridiculous. And you cannot help but marvel at the, the Miami that Latinos have built. I mean, it, it, the, the, it's amazing. It is amazing when you think of this like sleepy Jim Crow town that it was to what it has become today. It boggles the mind. Bilingualism, entrepreneurship have, have made Miami this hub for gajillions of dollars of commerce with Latin America. Senator Mel Martinez, who we interviewed in our documentary, came to Miami, as you all know, as a child refugee from Cuba. He arrived at Boys Town and was given a visa and a place to live and an excellent education and support and love every step of the way. It allowed him, he will be the first to tell you, it allowed him to rise to one of the most powerful jobs that you can have today in this nation. And at the same time I was interviewing him, I was interviewing a young woman, who I'll call Marta, since we can't tell you her name, who had also come to Miami. She'd been captured by Border Patrol, and she was living at a detention center, which is what Boys Town is now, for unaccompanied minors who come across the border. Still Boys Town, but 50 years later. And she's waiting adjudication on immigration charges. And she's been recently released into foster care, but we are following her story too. What happens to her? What would happen to her if she were given support and a visa and a path? Would she become Senator Martinez down the road? I don't know. My travels have also taken me to LA, also excellent food, uh, several times. <laughs> Uh, as you know, LA has experienced the highest numerical growth of Latinos last year. LA, of course, is a place where I think, uh, as Latinos, you feel like you've arrived. Everybody's speaking Spanish. Latinos are absolutely in every position of power. Um, and there's not as much questioning, I think, about sort of what are you doing here, certainly when you compare it to a place like Charlotte, North Carolina. We dominate the political scene. We dominate the cultural scene. And it's there that I met a young woman named uh, Cindy Garcia. She attends Fremont High School in East LA, and the LA school systems did not build schools for 39 years. At the same time, the population has exploded in LA. Of the 680,000 students in LA schools, 200,000 of them, so 680,000 students, 200,000 of them attend class in portable classrooms that after a certain number of decades, honestly, should not be called portable classrooms anymore, they're just the classrooms. It is a mirror of what Latinos face across the country. Latinos are the nation's most needy students. They are the most poor, most likely to attend the most overcrowded classrooms. Uh, a study done by the National Council of La Raza determined that Latinos are missing from Head Start programs, are missing from preschools, and this young woman who we follow, Cindy Garcia, desperately wants to graduate, desperately wants to graduate, fully understands that she will be missing out on the American economy if she does not graduate and move on to the next thing. Half of all the nation's school children by 2050 are going to be Latinos. Cindy Garcia is a metaphor for a whole bunch of students. And if Cindy and all these other students fail to be educated, there are tragic consequences, not just for them, but for the rest of us as a nation. We lose, not just them, and we meaning anybody here loses. The problems that Cindy faces are very much Latino problems, and very much at the same time problems made in the good old USA. They speak volumes about why identity matters. She is devoted to her family. She misses school to help her mother care for her siblings. She misses school to translate for her mother uh, demands of social workers, officials, anybody that her mother needs to deal with. Cindy leaves school. Cindy doesn't go. She has literally not enough hours of the day to study, and her school is called a dropout factory. 71% of the students in Cindy Garcia's school drop out. 70, I mean, think of that staggering number. 71% of these students drop out. Being Latina for Cindy Garcia is a blessing and a curse. She works so hard that it is breathtaking to watch her work. And in any other circumstance, this girl would be a star but she needs support. She wants to succeed so badly, and there are so many obstacles in her way. 
Her story is probably the one that stays with me the most, um, and I tell it to you today because there really is no certainty that Cindy graduates. Um, every week that goes by, we think, will Cindy make it? Oh, she's going to make it. No, she's not going to make it. Oh, she's going to make it. Oh, she's not going to make it. There is no certainty. And if she does not graduate, what well, we have to understand it's, it's our loss as a community. We define who we are. We get to change a community and change it for the better and enrich society and embrace education and build compassionate consciousness of our community. I want Cindy Garcia to have what I had, which is parent, you know, what my parents gave to me when they came, exactly what they came to this country for, a place to get good opportunity, education, support, self-esteem, a fundamental belief that whatever it is that you want to do, you can do it. When my mother would say that to me, I didn't roll my eyes. I truly believed her. I was like, okay, I can do it. We have to recognize that Cindy's story belongs to all of us and that we have to pledge to make the Cindy Garcias of this nation. And as our demographics change, there are a lot of potential Cindy Garcias. The Cindy Garcia's problems have to be our problems, and we have to embrace them, and we have to make our successes their successes too. That is what being Latino in America is, is succeeding, fulfilling the dream and the promise that, that we came here for, and then turning around and grabbing everybody else and making it happen for them too. I thank you for this opportunity to address you today.